Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Tonight, we're going to be talking about someone I wanted to get around to for a long time with this channel. Jacob Kurtzberg, better known by his pen name, Jack Kirby, and probably most aptly simply as the king of comics. Kirby is such a vast and any capable part of comic book history that it's rather difficult to do him any sort of justice without leaving too much out. While I covered a ton of ground in my previous Jack Kirby documentary series, Lord of Light, there were so many little bits and pieces that ended up on the cutting room floor or just didn't fit, it was beyond irritating. For the most part, I usually manage to let that kind of thing go and just move on. You can't use every bit of information that you gather through your research, no matter how rigorously you handle the subject matter in most cases, that's just the way things are and it usually doesn't get to me too badly. There was a bit that bothered me to cut though. It was one of the most interesting stories I'd come across involving Jack Kirby and a pleasant one at that which proved more of a rarity in the year plus I spent researching this piece than it should have. Originally, I was going to make this a Patreon exclusive video, but that just doesn't sit right with me. I hate hiding content behind a paywall and as I started working on it, the script continued to expand in scope and size. In the end, I wanted to share this story with as many people as possible for a few reasons, the least of which was that I kept getting asked why Jack Kirby would ever return to DC if they treated him anywhere near as poorly as I claimed. Despite his retirement from comics in 1979, from the big two at least, and while still extremely busy working for both Ruby Spears and Hanna-Barbera and putting out the Pacific comic Captain Victory, Kirby returned for not one, not two, but three DC series between 1983 and 1986. As it so happens, the answer to this question was also the story that I'd been so reluctantly forced to cut from my original script. So this is going to be kind of a two for tonight as we get into one of my all time favorite stories about Jack Kirby and explain why Jack Kirby returned to a company that had sent him running back into the arms of one of his greatest enemies less than a decade before. And it's a good one. So kick back and relax for another tasty tidbit of tawdry industry trivia and a little tale I like to call a second life for a fourth world. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, hit that like button, get in the comment section below and let me know. And if you really enjoy what you see, make sure you hog smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about signing up for the Patreon page, subscribing right here on YouTube, or just tipping the channel via the Ko-Fi links in the description. If that's not enough, you can even pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen. But now, let's get into it. As I said, a lot of people asked why Jack Kirby would ever return to DC Comics if he had ever been as mistreated as I claimed he was in my Lord of Light documentary series. If DC had indeed sabotaged his beloved fourth world material, many found it almost inconceivable that he would choose to return to the company unless out of dire necessity. It was no secret that the end of the fourth world in many ways signaled the end of Kirby's nearly unparalleled success and invention in comics, which had been an inexorable part of comic books since the 1940s, or that it had deeply wounded Kirby. And this is true. And there was no burning need for Jack Kirby to return to DC when he did. He was busy working on independent books like Captain Victory and Neck Deep in animation and concept work. So why did Jack Kirby come back to DC? Well, I could claim that there was unseen machinations at work, some massive concoction of factors at play which conspired to bring Kirby back to DC, some horrible thing that happened where he was hurting for money or that Jack Kirby felt some deep burning desire to return to comics. But that's just not true. Despite everything that led up to it and how complicated all of that might be, there was one single defining reason that DC invited Jack Kirby back 
and that he chose to accept, but as always, we'll get there soon enough. As I said, while there was a singular reason that Kirby was brought back to DC in the twilight years of his professional career, there's also some really interesting stuff at play here, much of which concerns the pendulous opinion of Kirby and his work by his peers. The way that his peers and fans perceived and especially received Kirby's work seemed to undergo dramatic shifts, and this plays heavily in our tale tonight. By the time he entered semi-retirement from the industry in 1979, issuing work from Marvel and DC for smaller, more creator-owned and controlled books such as Captain Victory from Pacific Comics, Jack Kirby had gone from being the darling of the industry, hailed as perhaps the single greatest cartoonist to have ever worked in comics for decades, to literally being the laughingstock of both the Marvel and DC offices. He had been relentlessly persecuted by editors in malicious and abhorrent ways trying to sabotage and undermine his career out of resentment and jealousy. He'd had his art hung on the walls of the offices where he worked, covered in pejoratives, ridiculing Kirby and his writing. It was difficult for me to even read about as a fan. I cannot begin to imagine how Jack Kirby felt. I mean, I could hardly fathom treating anyone like that, let alone Jack Kirby. Sure, Kirby could be kind of difficult, gruff, and abrasive, but this was for good reason. Unfortunately, this led to him rather unfairly earning a reputation for being a bit of a curmudgeon, which simply was not true. Kirby was defensive, and having seen the worst the industry had to offer, was always weary of being taken advantage of Again, he'd make millions of dollars for Stan Lee, Martin Goodman, and Marvel Comics, and many, many more. He delivered DC, a literal cosmos of characters, and this was all just in a 15-year span between 1960 and 1975. Kirby had been doing the same thing for whoever happened to be his employer for nearly 40 years by the mid-70s. In turn, when Kirby had gotten older and outlived his usefulness, starting to make demands like fair pay and proper accreditation for the work that he was doing, he'd promptly been run out of the industry and treated like a veritable pariah as a result. Following his run-ins with both Marvel and DC, which we chronicled in the Lord of Light documentary series, Jack Kirby had soured once and for all on mainstream comics, or at least it seemed. He'd felt trapped in the industry, and there's little doubt that he never would have even made the move to DC Comics if he hadn't worried so much about not being able to reinvent himself in a new career at his age. Eventually, almost by accident, Kirby had found the world of animation around 1970 and his life was changed forever. Animation is where he spent the better part of the next eight years and thank God enjoyed perhaps the best part of his professional career and just in the nick of time too. The work for Ruby Spears and Hanna-Barbera was steady. Most of the people he worked with worshipped the ground he walked on. It paid well and it offered health care. Kirby held on to his animation work for as long as he could but Kirby was getting older. He was tired and his body just could not take the same kind of unceasing punishment that it had been subjected to for more than 40 years. Kirby had been pushing himself to his mental and physical limits for decades by 1978. This was starting to take its toll on his mind and his body. His eyesight was starting to go in his left eye. His anchors found themselves unable to save more and more of his illustrations because of skewed perspectives and lines that just didn't make sense or even work. According to Dick Giordano, more than half of Jack's work was unusable for for this reason by the time he started for Hanna-Barbera in 1980. Kirby's mental state wasn't all that much better either, apparently. He was reportedly so out of it by this time, he wasn't even allowed to drive a car for fear he would mentally drift off, imagining himself in a rocket ship or something. There had been, apparently, several occasions where Kirby had actually driven up on curbs and stuff like that, and as a result, he was not allowed to drive anymore. His wife, Roz, would drive him to Hanna-Barbera and the Ruby Spears offices 
once or twice a week, and that's how he got around. It wasn't just driving, though, and there were other signs that Jack Kirby was beginning to suffer from problems with his memory and cognizance as well, a problem which continued to progress during his four-year stint in animation. By 1984, at nearly 67 years old, Jack Kirby was planning his retirement, not making big grandiose plans for some magnificent return to the medium that he felt had so unfairly maligned and mistreated him though. And he wasn't just planning on leaving animation this time either. Jack Kirby was planning to exit the workforce altogether. He had been working non-stop since he was in his 20s, and Kirby wanted to spend more time with his family and enjoy the time that he had left. Work was obviously becoming more and more of a struggle as each year passed. It seemed to matter less and less to him, and it felt like for the first time in forever, Jack Kirby was maybe getting burnt out. The piss and vinegar was gone. The signs that Jack Kirby was done were all there, and they had been for years. But out of nowhere, in 1982, seven years after Jack Kirby had fled from the company as quickly as he could following the complete implosion of his fourth world titles, DC made the king of comics an offer that he couldn't refuse, though sadly he found himself thrust right back where he'd been in the first place in a lot of ways. Now, it's no secret that Jack Kirby was not happy about being unable to finish his fourth world odyssey, although he never really had an ending in mind per se. Jack Kirby saw the entire thing as this continuous ongoing cycle where even if, say, Darkseid and Orion were to die, there would always be new gods to take their place. Needless to say, he'd had big plans despite fans' lukewarm receptions. Sales have been lower than expected, but not bad enough to get the series canned outright. That is until DC had made a major misstep in a price war against Marvel, which had not only wound up costing the company dearly financially, but due to increases in the cost of books, Kirby lost his beloved fourth world in the process as well. The rumblings that DC had used these circumstances to intentionally sabotage the fourth world project and their unwillingness to work with Kirby or allow him to do what he wanted and was promised the freedom to do when he joined DC couldn't have been far from mind either. Kirby had gone into the fourth world with such high hopes and was so personally invested, I think it was a devastating blow when he lost it all in what must have seemed like the blink of an eye. Despite the insane amount of characters and stories that Jack Kirby created and worked on during his time at Marvel and innumerable other publishers over the years, I don't think any of them were ever even approaching as personal and uniquely Kirby as the fourth world was. That is aside from the work that he did on the Galactus trilogy. The fact that the Silver Surfer, who was born of this work, and one of the only characters that Jack Kirby ever created at Marvel without editorial interference had been one of the major breaking points, causing Kirby to leave them for the first time in the 1970s is no coincidence either in my opinion. Following the loss of his fourth world, Kirby cut his losses and left DC as soon as possible once his contract was up. Kirby felt a kinship to all of his creations, and it was devastating for him to have them unceremoniously taken from him one by one, only to be twisted and misinterpreted by other writers and artists in Kirby's eyes. The fourth world was supposed to be different, though. DC had promised him creative freedom and control. He was finally going to be left alone to do what he did best, come up with characters and stories without the constant interference or input from meddling editors. It had all come crashing down around his ears though, and the fourth world had been unceremoniously cut short after less than a dozen issues in what was supposed to be Kirby's greatest achievement. Instead, month by month, title by title, the project was dismantled and taken from him until there was nothing left following the disastrous price wars with Marvel. 
Kirby had years of plots and stories, ideas and concepts and characters that he was looking forward to introducing throughout the Fourth World books, only a fraction of which ever came to fruition. Despite their claims and promises and even some serious supporters, it had been clear from the moment he started work on the project that he and DC were not seeing eye to eye. They'd clashed repeatedly over how Kirby would handle the titles, who would draw them and write them and even what they were going to be about. This had not been part of the deal, but Kirby had done his best to work through it like he always did. The fourth world had been a horse of another color, however. While it feels like Kirby was able to write off so much of what he had created over the years, even the most beloved of his Marvel creations, and abandon them in the hands of Stan Lee, Martin Goodman, Jim Shooter, and innumerable others, the fourth world appears to have been different. And honestly, I don't know what hurt Kirby more but this time, no one came along and twisted the new gods beyond recognition. No one really even tried to do anything with the story or the characters after Kirby's departure and the series' initial cancellation. In fact, almost the entire fourth world just kind of sat there. And this, this seems to have really eaten at Kirby. Not being allowed to finish his grand cosmic opus was bad enough, but seeing them languish unused and half forgotten was one of the few true regrets that it seems that Kirby ever stewed over. And worse yet, it was one that it appeared he would never be able to remedy. DC seemingly had completely lost interest in almost all of the characters and stories that he'd introduced. Jack didn't even own stake in any of his creations and abandoned after only 11 issues a decade prior to an ambivalent audience, the fourth world seemed doomed to float in this nebulous, hazy place. That is, until Jack Kirby's phone rang sometime in 1982. While interest in basically all of his other creations had faded, Darkseid and his Dominion Apocalypse had become one of the preeminent villains in the DC Universe, though few remembered his new god's origins at the time. Darkseid was undoubtedly one of Kirby's greatest creations, and his growing popularity was about to set into motion one of the strangest and most interesting tales about Jack Kirby that I've ever come across. Out of the blue, DC was suddenly not only interested in finishing the fourth world story that Kirby had set out to tell, but to introduce an entirely new generation of readers to the work that had missed it in the first place. So it was after nearly a decade that Jack Kirby's phone rang and he was approached with the tantalizing prospect of finally being allowed to finish up his cosmic odyssey. Unlike in years prior, the promise of finishing his work wasn't enough to lure Kirby, who had endured a trial by fire at the company during his short stint there in the mid-1970s back to the company, however. The ridicule and absurd treatment that he had received while there still stung and Kirby was instantly on the defensive. As it happened though, during the intervening years between Kirby's exit from the mainstream comics industry for the first time in 1979 and DC approaching him to come back to work for them in 1982, there had been a complete 180 concerning Jack Kirby's work once again, and not just at DC, but in general. Only four years before, Kirby had been a complete laughingstock in his own workplace, openly mocked and derided by everyone from co-workers to his editors and would-be editors at both Marvel and DC. Beyond this, DC had made what I consider to be the cardinal sin among the sins that one can commit against your artists. Kirby never went into it at length in interviews, and while I spoke about this during the Lord of Light documentary, it deeply wounded Kirby that his artwork was constantly being altered without his knowledge or consent at DC. Eventually, it stopped hurting him, and it started making him angry. He'd had problems like this at Marvel with his dialogue, but DC was pasting up entirely new faces on a lot of his work, and no one would put a stop to it, especially during his time on Jimmy Olsen when he was drawing iconic DC characters, namely Superman. DC would alter, or in some cases, as I said, entirely replace Kirby's faces routinely as they felt that his style was dramatically different than what their readers were used to, and it might put them off. 
And if this sounds preposterously stupid, to go through all of the trouble of luring Kirby away from Marvel and hiring him on as an artist, only to then literally pay people to alter or paste up faces by other artists over his work sounds ludicrous to you. You are not alone, and I don't think you're wrong either. Many people, especially those in prominent editorial positions, literally hated not only Jack Kirby's art, but saw him simply as mindless, talentless competition and nothing more. Some were jealous of the sales he had managed to generate while at Marvel, others that he had toppled DC from their top spot, but most dangerously, People were very upset about Kirby's absolute refusal to surrender rights to work that he knew he was doing, such as scripting, plotting, or writing the glorified dialogue writers parading around as authors. Kirby had hit his limit while at Marvel and was more than a little abrasive when it came to his staunch refusal to cave on this subject, basically refusing to work from anything but a full script or on his own. Kirby's increasingly defensive behavior and the saboteurs inside of DC had in turn led to an increasingly hostile work environment which prevented Kirby from making real headway with anything he did while at the company. If things were so bad, you might wonder what the carrot on the end of the stick that brought Kirby back into the fold was, and that's kind of the crux of our little tale here. Much like his original tenure at DC, unfortunately, there's not an inordinate amount of direct quotes or firsthand information regarding how Kirby came to be back at the company sometime in 1982. If you look at what happened and how it happened, the facts do paint a fairly clear picture of at least the basics of what occurred. However, DC had, at least in their minds, finally come up with a way to cash in on Kirby's fourth world creations in a very real way. But to do this, it was felt that a few things needed to be addressed. Namely, Kirby needed to return to DC to finish what he'd started and in the process introduce an entirely new generation of readers to his fourth world material. As I mentioned before, the times were changing at DC and opinions of Kirby and his work were shifting radically once again. While this had originally proven to be rather problematic for Kirby as his supporters grew older and had lost their power and prominence within the company, leading to a weakened bargaining position and leaving no one to defend him or his treatment at DC. Time passed, and those that had so vehemently despised and undermined Kirby quickly lost their power as well. However, their reign had fallen, and the guard had changed once more at DC during the early 1980s. This time, though, the pendulum swung in Kirby's direction as more and more devout fans and followers rose to prominence in every corner and crevice of the industry. A lot of people had literally grown up on Kirby's work and worshipped the ground that he worked on. Others only knew Kirby through his almost unbelievable artistic imprint and the innumerable characters he'd created. Jack Kirby wasn't just beloved anymore. Once he left the industry and people knew what they were missing, once they had about five seconds to take a look at what they had run off from comic books, they began to miss Kirby almost immediately. There was a growing number of people that not only loved Jack Kirby, but were also painfully aware of the atrocious treatment and poor pay that Kirby had received for his efforts. And more importantly, many of these people were ascending to positions of serious power at DC especially. Among these Kirby supporters who rose to power at DC around this time were Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn. Jeanette Kahn wasn't just climbing the ranks at DC, though. She went from 0 to 50 in about five years, starting as an editor at DC in 1976 before becoming president by 1981. Levitz was a well-respected writer turned editor and most likely along with other longtime supporter Dick Giordano, who was definitely involved in one respect or another. These were the three individuals that approached Jack Kirby about returning to DC to finish what he'd started low those many years before. Given how burnt Kirby was on the industry at this point, and considering his past treatment at the hands of the industry, and DC in particular, they knew they had to approach Kirby with a serious proposition that was worth his time and effort, as well as a great deal more respect. That being said, only a few details about what transpired between Jack Kirby, 
Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn specifically have ever surfaced. It's certain that Jack Kirby was offered the opportunity to finish his work, but it's also highly likely that he was also promised a great deal more creative control this time around as well. Again, this has never been concretely or empirically confirmed in interviews by either Jack Kirby or anyone else involved, but there's a number of things that serve as evidence that this is the case in my opinion. Chief among this evidence is actually the first work that Kirby would go on to complete for the proposed project that they had come to Kirby with, but before we get into all of that, let's lay out exactly what we do know that DC approached Jack Kirby with and how it was supposed to be released. See, DC had big plans for the fourth world characters, but there were a few problems. They were great designs, they were well conceived, and over the preceding decade or so, Darkseid had continued to rise to more and more prominence and popularity among both fans and creators alike to become one of DC's preeminent villains despite the abject failure and half-forgotten nature of the series that he came from. One of the biggest problems with reintroducing people to the characters and about getting things moving again was that the entire Fourth World Odyssey had stopped entirely without warning. New Gods, Mr. Miracle, and Forever People had all left on cliffhangers with so many unanswered questions. Any attempts that DC had made to bring anyone other than Kirby in to work on the characters or any of the other series had proven to be failures for one reason or another, basically all of which sputtered out after only a few issues. Despite the fact that he had once again risen to prominence and his name was quietly being whispered with reverence once again, I think that this is the main reason they knew they had to get Jack Kirby back to finish the story. Although interestingly, it's not why they felt they needed him back at the company to begin with. But we'll get there, I swear. No one could make the fourth world thing work without Jack Kirby, though. It was that simple. You just could not hire some random writer or even some huge superstar either. They needed Kirby back if there was any hope of tying up the story and introducing new readers to the characters. While a lot of what took place seems to have never really been documented straight out, we know for sure that after a ton of back and forth, DC was going to let Kirby start the series off exactly where they had left off with their original cancellation. The idea was that Jack Kirby would produce a new floppy issue that would finish off the arcs from each series and these would lead into a larger, more comprehensive story which would be around 100 pages or so and tie up the cosmic drama once and for all. This would not only let new readers get in on the characters, but wipe the slate clean in a lot of ways for any writers or artists coming after Kirby working on the material. This idea was wrought with problems from its inceptions that no one in the room seemed to want to address though, the least of which not being that Jack Kirby had never actually had an ending in mind to the point that I don't think it was supposed to have one. Jack saw the fourth world as something that would go on and on forever, like an Aurora Boris eating its own tail. When one set of gods grew tired or old, there would always be new gods. He had toyed with a few things and usually teased one of two ideas to people over the years, but it's clear that Jack Kirby had never seen a clear ending for the fourth world, and most certainly not one that would be wrapped up in a single swoop of the pen in a hundred pages. Jack Kirby is always having trouble saying no though, took on the assignment with his usual gusto and approached longtime anchor and collaborator Mike Royer about the project. Excited by the proposition, Kirby and Royer apparently leapt into action and began to work on the proposed 12th issue of New Gods before they ever got the full go-ahead from DC, that is. Unfortunately, this proved to be more than a little premature. This story is the first in a series of events that indicate while there was a great deal more respect for Kirby and even a much more honest wish to honor and, and to give him freedom as well as better compensation for his work, Jack Kirby and DC once again found themselves at an impasse over the content of the new Fourth World material before it ever even started. 
Interestingly, while Kirby had obviously chosen to go in one direction from almost the start, there's a number of quotes from Kirby indicating he also had an entirely other ending for the fourth world in mind at one point, or at least that he told people he did. When asked what would happen when the inevitable confrontation between Darkseid and Orion occurred, Kirby spoke about how even if his son were to hurt him, he would never be able to harm his own flesh or blood. And he was all of his characters. So if Darkseid and Orion ever did actually come to their final fight that's prophesized throughout the pages of the fourth world, that neither father would be able to harm son or son father. As far as actually writing and delivering something, I think that both Kirby and Royer were agreed that there was really only one way to end New Gods and the Fourth World Odyssey in general, actually. The same way that Kirby had wanted to end Thor. One last grand epochal battle that would claim the lives of most of the main cast, but specifically culminating in a devastating confrontation which would claim the lives of both Orion and Darkseid. The only quotation that I could find about a proposed ending to New Gods in the Fourth World was Kirby's talk about father and son not being able to fight, and I found numerous claims that Kirby even went so far as turning in a 20 to 24 page treatment of this angle, which was summarily turned down by DC. While I couldn't find any empirical evidence that this pitch ever went that far, or in fact even actually physically existed anywhere outside of Kirby's head, it would go a long way in explaining the vast chasm that exists between this pitch and what follows. I should also say that if it did actually get so far as being written up and submitted to DC, it's my belief that this would have chronologically taken place after the following story. The pages that Kirby and Royer turned into DC could not have told a more different story if they tried. As I mentioned, Jack Kirby and Mike Royer were busy figuring things out, and while he was a little older and maybe a little bit slower, Jack Kirby started busting out layout pages and even rough pencils for the proposed final issue of New Gods, which was to lead into a proposed final miniseries that would comprise a concrete finale for the fourth world titles and characters once and for all. These pages Pages are the only art that I could track down as far as something I know that was submitted to DC, and they were definitely based on the ending that Lee had shot down for Thor decades prior with this cataclysmic battle destroying basically everything. The fact that Jack was so vehement about not doing what he called free work makes me strongly believe that part of their original agreement was a great deal more of creative freedom. I do not see the 66-year-old Kirby simply busting out pages on a whim at this point. As soon as DC actually saw the pages and got wind that Kirby was planning on killing not just Orion, which he might have actually gotten away with, but Darkseid as well, they got a hold of him to tell him there was no way he was killing off these or any other fourth world characters. They had hired Jack Kirby to reinvigorate interest in the characters and kind of set the stage for them to do something new with them outside of the shadow of the original story that Jack Kirby had set in motion years prior. What's crazy to me is how much it feels like each party had forgotten how things had originally gone. It was like history repeating itself, and no one seemed to be phased by the fact that Everyone had left the fourth world deal a loser the first time around and that they seemed to be on track for a monumental amount of trouble ahead. I think that Jack Kirby had his head in the sand because he wanted to finish the fourth world stuff, but more importantly because of promises that had been made to him by Jeanette Kahn and Paul Levitz. Kirby also thought he should be allowed to do what he wanted with his characters, and this included killing Darkseid and Orion. DC conversely felt like they finally had an angle for the fourth world characters that would work and make them profitable, and they were not interested in killing them off in any way, shape, or form. Quite the opposite. As I've said, unfortunately, there's not a ton of direct material out there about how Kirby reacted to being told once more that he wasn't going to be allowed to do what he wanted with the characters that he'd created and were so close to his heart. 
But I can't imagine that he was super pleased about having wasted time writing and drawing material that DC almost immediately axed. This is when I am guessing Jack Kirby decided to go ahead with his father can't fight son proposal and sent in a treatment if that did indeed happen, only to have that summarily dismissed as well. Yes, if my research is right, Jack Kirby actually had stories where Darkseid and Orion killed each other and where they wouldn't even fight, both turned down. It had to be absolutely maddening, but surprisingly, he didn't walk. Not under contract and under no real obligation aside from his own nagging sense of obligation that I'm aware of, this is another clear sign of the heft of the offer that DC had presented Kirby with in order to get him back. And don't worry, I promise we're almost there. From what I can tell, Kirby didn't even really blink an eye after having the pitches and the proposal pages turned down. He just figured out what DC did want and then set to repurposing as much of the work that he'd already done as he possibly could while sticking to the new story mandates that were being imposed on him by editorial. In light of these proposals and displeased with how things were going, DC quickly worked out a plan of action hoping to keep Kirby happy and busy while also addressing their concerns with killing Darkseid and Ryan. Kirby's story and his dialogue. With DC's input, Kirby eventually created an entirely new 12th issue for New Gods that bridged the story from the title and the rest of the fourth world into a graphic novel of sorts that would become known as Hunger Dogs. Hunger Dogs is a somewhat standalone graphic novel that weakly attempts to tie up all the loose ends from Kirby's fourth world run. There's no doubt that Kirby was frustrated, especially when Joe Orlando tried to go around his back and tamper with his dialogue again. Apparently, Orlando approached Mark Ebenier with concerns about Jack Kirby's dialogue at one point, to which Mark Ebenier told him straight out, talk to Jack Kirby and tell him what's going on. He told Orlando to tell Kirby that he wanted another writer and that Mark Evanier himself would lend assistance if he wanted, but he told Orlando that Jack Kirby was 100% absolutely not going to go for it. Probably knowing that Evanier was right, Orlando made a stupendously idiotic misstep. Without talking to, consulting, or even bringing the subject up with Jack Kirby, Jorlando subsequently ran a full page ad in the Comic Buyer's Guide, proudly proclaiming that Mark Evanier was going to be doing the dialogue for Hunger Dogs. When Kirby saw this, he absolutely hit the roof. It had been an explicit part of Kirby coming back that his art and dialogue were not to be tampered with in any way, shape, or form without his permission. That's why Kirby had recruited his own anchors and was being so hard on them about the work. Even more crazy is the claims that Greg Theakston has made about the art for Hunger Dogs. According to Greg Theakston, who I'm inclined to believe as he's not really got a horse in this race, but according to Theakston, Kirby was nearly 67 years old, was getting so impossible to work with that he insisted that his inkers not change a single line. Problematically though, Kirby was basically going blind in one eye and his pencils were getting less and less comprehensible. According to Theakston, who was hired on to paint over Kirby's pencils for the cover only to Hunger Dogs, when the art came in, there were actually two anchors, Douglas Bruce Berry and Mike Royer. Neither style complemented the other, and even more problematically, they had both messed up implied lighting, and the art was blocky and unpolished. In short, Hunger Dogs was an absolute wreck. Theakston instead, he took it to Jeanette Kahn, who literally told him to, quote, do whatever he wanted with it. Theakston, who is a massive Kirby fan, took the art home with him and worked on it for an entire week for free, correcting faces, fixing anatomy and other parts of the art, and generally cleaning stuff up and getting stuff to match up halfway decently. If this claim is true, which I, again, am inclined to believe that it is, I was never able to find Kirby's reaction to having his art changed again if he did discover it. Even if this stuff had improved his work, which everyone unanimously agreed by this point needed some assistance and help, that was help that Jack Kirby was growing increasingly unwilling to accept. 
This was the same kind of crap the DC had pulled the first time around. And what's crazy is this isn't the only change that DC made to his art. I'd heard rumblings that Barry might not have been recruited by Jack Kirby himself. I know that Mike Royer was personally picked by Jack Kirby for his ability to remain painfully true to Jack Kirby's pencil work in a lot of cases. Barry, on the other hand, I was unable to find any such information on, despite Greg Theakston stating that there were two anchors. Barry was also officially credited in Hunger Dogs, and I think that the pages that he worked on were the 24 pages that Jack Kirby originally did with the ending where Orion and Darkseid kill each other, and that he originally submitted under the name Road to Armagato. Back in 2008, DC re-released The Fourth World with 24 pages of, quote, unaltered art with, quote, original inks by Mike Royer. These pages had to be reworked painstakingly when they were originally released because they were intended for a regular-sized trim comic book format, not the smaller, skinnier DC graphic novel size. While I don't know for sure that Jack Kirby wasn't made aware of this, Joe Orlando's stunt with dialogue and Theakston's reworking of the art both heavily point in this direction. This would also probably explain why the exasperated Jeanette Kahn, who was so resolute in getting Jack Kirby back to DC in the first place and played a pivotal role in setting up the deal, seemed so ambivalent about the entire thing, telling Theakston he could, quote, do whatever he wanted with Hunger Dogs. Either way, had Kirby discovered what was going on behind the scenes, this could have easily spelled the end of their strange relationship in this latter part of Kirby's professional career, but it did not. For years, I had wondered why Kirby seemed to be just taking this stuff on the chin without walking away from DC, and the answer is really interesting, actually. While Kirby wasn't necessarily pleased as Punch about how the new material was coming together or even the direction that it was taking, DC had agreed to republish all of his original Fourth World material. On top of that, they were going to do it with better colors, more expensive paper, stiffer covers, the whole nine yards this time around. On top of this, I'd heard for years that DC somehow grandfathered Kirby into their newer contracts regarding his new God's creations with these reprints. The new contract supposedly allowed Kirby access to DC's new royalty payments, something that greatly interested Kirby, who had been growing increasingly interested in the prospect of creator-owned characters and comics over the last decade since his departure from Marvel and DC in 1979. This wasn't completely true, but it does hint at why Kirby stuck around. Royalties. DC had indeed cooked up a way to compensate and in fact even grandfather Kirby into the contract, but it was not through the fourth world reprints or even the new Hunger Dogs work. It goes much deeper than that actually. Jack Kirby took the rejected New Gods pages and repurposed some of them into a third story, a one-off standalone 24-pager called On the Road to Armageddon instead, which comprises the altered pages that the aforementioned solicitation referred to. Armageddon was, however, also summarily rejected as well. Admittedly, Armageddon doesn't really provide any concrete ending to the series, but it's almost inconceivable that Jack Kirby put up with having not one, not two, but three proposals of radically differing designs for his fourth world work turned down by a publisher who had invited him back to work on the material to begin with. Add to this, by 1975, Jack Kirby had developed an insane reputation for being almost impossible to work with if you crossed him or he didn't like what was going on. He wasn't the meanest man in the room, but he was sure as hell the most stubborn. When Kirby dug in his heels, there wasn't much moving him. He refused to work with people even when he knew that they were sabotaging his career and just giving them a byline in a book would have stopped the harassment. Even when they started taping his pages to the walls and making fun of him, Kirby would not cave. And it didn't have anything to do with money. It was the principle of the thing. That was 15 years before this. 
almost 20. Kirby hadn't softened in his old age, and if anything, he'd just become more set in his ways and resolute in his convictions. This is why it seems so damned weird that it didn't seem to matter what DC tossed in him, what they told him he couldn't do, or what they changed during this period. Jack Kirby just kept chugging along, trying his best to keep his head down as much as possible while retaining the integrity of his work where he could and when he could. The more you read about this period, the more you discover how he was treated like a human punching bag, basically the same as the first time around, only that he was nearly 20 years older, the more you get the sense that Jack Kirby was working for DC out of what I can only describe as an almost inexhaustible sense of obligation. Though what this sense of obligation was for, however, I was completely in the dark about. It just did not make sense. Things came into much clearer focus following some research into the history surrounding the release of the double-length 48-page Even Gods Must Die, however, and the plot really began to thicken. After the pages for On the Road to Armageddon and its other pages had been rejected, the story that DC eventually ended up, I think, spoon-feeding Kirby was anticlimactic and obviously forced to put it kindly. Even Gods Must Die is obviously deceptively titled, and rather ironically so, considering Kirby's original plans when he came back to the fourth world and DC's refusal to allow him to move in that direction. Kirby was pretty obviously intent on killing Orion and Darkseid when he came up with the concepts that he eventually ended up using despite their tripe rejection. DC was obviously just as resolute on the fact that this not happened. In the end, DC, I think, basically forced Kirby to have Darkseid overthrown by the people of Apocalypse, the world that he so despotically rules over and is forced into exile. There's no big battle or even an anticlimactic non-battle, which I personally think would have been a stroke of sheer brilliance, and I definitely wouldn't call it the most satisfying ending, or even really an ending at all, because, you know, Darkseid's going to be back, but it did manage to accomplish several of the goals that everyone had in mind for the project in the beginning. It provided at least a passable bridgeway between what Kirby had done and what others could do with the characters moving forward. While DC didn't have any big plans for comics as such, this also included a certain upcoming toy line. A toy line which has not only become legendary among collectors, garnering absolutely berserk prices on the secondhand collector's market at this point, and heralded as one of the high watermarks of action figures, but is still lauded as one of the most interesting and accurate action figure lines of all time. I am, of course, referring to the Superpowers toy line, and yes, believe it or not, this Kenner toy line is the nexus point for why Kirby Dane returned to DC and is the reason that Kirby seemed to feel so indebted to DC at this point, as well as why DC even wanted him back in the first place. While pay on the new work for DC was nice, this was in fact secondary to the real reason that Jack Kirby had agreed to come back to work for the company, in my opinion, money. And lots of it. While I don't think that Jack Kirby ever explicitly stated this outright, I don't see any other reason he would have put up with the back and forth over his proposed work given his disposition and reasons for leaving the industry in disgust the first time in 1979. Obviously, nothing had changed. DC was still altering his art without his permission, they were still messing with his dialogue and not letting him tell the stories that he wanted to tell, and the superpowers toy line is why. In reality, the fourth world comic books themselves were totally ancillary when it came to why Kirby returned to DC. The entire reason Kirby agreed to come back and work for DC is actually pretty funny. They were going to let him redesign his fourth world characters for the upcoming superpowers toy line. Yep, that's it. I told you it was pretty simple in the beginning, didn't I? Jack Kirby was going to do some card art and redesign some characters, and not even for DC, but for Kenner at that. This totally explains why Kirby had been playing a human punching bag for nearly 18 agonizing months as they scraped together something passable for the Hunger Dogs and even God's Must Die releases. Neither party was super invested in the comic books, not like they were in the toys. 
It also explains how DC managed to grandfather Kirby into the newer royalty rights contract agreement, which I had never been able to figure out. Kenner was flush with Star Wars money and on the hunt for the next big thing. They were chomping at the bit to work with DC, remembering the success Mego had enjoyed and giving what a runaway hit Hanna-Barbera's Super Friends cartoon was at the time. Kenner wasn't the only one who came calling, though, and there was a pretty heated race taking place with Mattel over the license, actually. The competition with Mattel was stiff, and it was extremely important because it meant that each company had to bring their A-game and really toss the best of what they had at DC in hopes of landing the licenses for some of the biggest names in comic book history. While Mattel had a few different ideas that DC liked, Kenner came out swinging. They proposed that each figure would have their own superpower or ability that the figure would be capable of performing. This would help to give the toys almost infinite replay value, and DC definitely perked up when they had heard this, but it wasn't the thing that entirely sold them. Kenner eventually went out because they were going to do two very important things. First, they weren't going to just swap out head molds and bodies and stuff for the line and compromise the figures by making them all look like cookie cutter copies of each other. Batman would have a different head mold and a different appearance than Superman. Wonder Woman would be a distinct mold. The Penguin was going to be super short. It sounds like common sense today, but at the time, having figures of different scales in the same line was something of a no-no for a lot of people who thought it detracted from an all-across-the-board appearance that appealed to children. Second, and most important for our little tale tonight, they weren't going to skimp on the art. Unlike most companies that wanted to cut corners wherever they could and use in-house graphic designers, Kenner wanted to recruit real-life DC comic book artists to tackle a myriad of different tasks on the superpowers line. Because of the success of Masters of the Universe, they wanted to create many comics, and this made bringing actual comic book artists on board doubly important in Kenner's eyes. They also wanted comic book accurate art for the packaging and help redesigning the characters from the two-dimensional world of the comic book pages to the three-dimensional one. This would not only ensure that the figures were accurate enough to please DC and grease the wheels should the line be a hit and they wanted to work together in the future, but for kids or anyone else that read the comics when they saw the packaging, they would instantly recognize whoever was being represented. On the crowded shelves in the 1980s, visual distinction and recognition was a difficult battle to win, but Kenner was perfecting the mechanics which had allowed them to turn the Star Wars license into one of the largest toy markets in history. I think that Kenner kind of had tunnel vision going on a little bit, though. All they saw were the licenses to characters like Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman going up for grabs. They hadn't considered the line as a whole, really, and although Kenner was apparently really gung-ho when they started the project, as they neared completion on the first wave, they realized there was a huge problem. While basically all of the big heroes from the DCU were represented in superpowers, both Kenner and DC agreed that they had needed way stronger villains. The Joker and the Penguin, which they had done, were not formidable adversaries for the likes of Superman or Aquaman. With all of DC's heaviest hitters, they needed someone who felt like he could stand against Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman all at once. They quickly added Legion of Doom members Brainiac and Lex Luthor to the series one lineup, but they needed more, and it wasn't long before someone suggested Darkseid, and when Kenner saw the designs, they legit flipped out. Just like those that he worked with in animation, it seems like Kenner almost immediately became enamored with Kirby's designs and not just Darkseid. It wasn't long before the entire second wave of the Superpowers toy line would be centered around Darkseid, who for the record even outshone Superman and Batman in much of the promotional material for the Superpowers toys. As the line continued to expand, they would include more and more of Kirby's designs, including Kalabak, Desaad, Mantis, Steppenwolf, and even a Parademon. 
Kirby was reportedly brought on to work on, I believe, every single one of his characters that was ever even considered for the line and ended up contributing designs for every one of his characters that actually made it to the line. Now, this might not sound like a big deal if you're unfamiliar with the toy industry, but it is. Comics are a small niche industry. Even at the top of the food chain these days, the money is paltry at best, and there's little back end outside of trades and reprints when you're working with companies like Marvel and DC, and especially when you're playing with their characters at that. Toys, on the other hand, well now, that's another story. While the bottom would fall out of the action figure market due to a glut in the mid-90s that was actually heavily tied to Marvel Comics and the speculators boom, in the 1982 landscape, action figures were quite literally taking the world by storm. There had been toy crazes before, but no one had ever seen anything like the Star Wars craze. Every kid had to have every figure, and they begged their parents for innumerable play sets and vehicles. It was utter madness. Soon there was a massive rush by anyone and everyone to get in on the action as massive deregulation by the Reagan administration abolished practices that prevented a number of questionable but highly successful marketing tactics aimed towards children. Soon kids were awash in marketing and advertisement, and the Superpowers line by Kenner might be one of the strongest examples of the types of innovation required to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Masters of the Universe and Transformers, which were popular at the time. There were hundreds of millions of dollars just floating around, and it was up to anyone interested to just reach out and grab it. Seeing an opportunity and knowing how good his designs were, Jack Kirby was apparently one of the first people that DC thought of when they pitched the line to Kenner originally in 1982. He was responsible for much of the original pitch material when it came to designs, and this makes it explicitly clear that Paul Levitz and Genetic Khan wanted to make things right with Kirby unbelievably. I literally can find no other explanation as to why Levitz, Khan, and presumably Giordano jumped through the hoops and bent over the way that they did to accommodate Jack and make sure he was paid as much and as well as possible for his work. They waited until his design work for the Superpowers toys were done to start work on the fourth world material so that he could be grandfathered in on the new royalty contract and collect on any sales from the new printings of the books. This ensured that any and all characters that Kirby had had a hand in creating were in turn redesigned for him and he was given proper compensation for that work as well as royalties to those characters in the future. The way that Jeanette Kahn, Paul Levitz, and Dick Giordano saw it, Kirby had been mistreated when he was at the company originally and deserved proper compensation. They weren't in the financial position to offer that out of the DC coffer though, so they sat down and cooked up a way to get Kenner to foot the bill. Kenner's pockets ran deep, especially at this moment, and there had to have been a fairly astronomical amount of money for the time involved. There had actually been enough money that DC didn't even really mind taking a bath on the re-release of the original material or all of the upgrades that they threw at the new printings, Hunger Dogs, Road to Armageddon, even Gods Must Die, any of it. Which, for the record, they took a beating on. If the fourth world material didn't bomb the first time that it was released, it sure as hell did the second time around. None of this mattered though, because it was all secondary as to why Kirby had been brought into the fold. And despite all of the problems and hurdles that he faced working on new fourth world material for DC, Kirby couldn't have cared less. Though he perhaps should have, it's taken decades for the fourth world material to claw its way out of dollar issue bins and attics because it wasn't just summarily dismissed when it was originally released, but the disappointing follow-up did even worse and was pretty much swept under the rug by DC and everyone else involved for decades. It wasn't until the price on most Kirby Marvel books began to become so cost prohibitive that younger generations started fishing new gods and Mr. Miracle especially out of back issue bins and utterly fell in love with the fourth world. Today it's widely regarded as one of the high watermarks not just for Kirby but of mainstream comics and is widely hailed as one of the greatest achievements in the superhero medium. Hunger Dogs and this entire debacle is one of the reasons that it took so long for this thing to turn 
turn around, though. This was all done with the best of intentions, and I honestly don't think that anyone foresaw the problems and difficulties that lay ahead of them when Kirby came back to DC. When Khan and Levitz approached Kirby about the entire thing to begin with, he'd been cagey to say the least. Having been treated like he had and seen the worst of the industry with companies like Marvel Mania still fresh in his mind due to his continued legal battles over retention of his original art with Marvel, Kirby was going to walk during the initial meeting at a local motel where Khan and Levitz were staying in town. That is, until Jeanette Khan basically told him outright, look, we know you got treated unfairly, and not just by Marvel, but by DC. People treated you like crap, and they shouldn't have. Someone should have done something, but we can't go back in time. On top of that, you should have been paid for your fourth world creations. You gave the company exactly what it asked for, and they basically threw it back in your face when it didn't work. Unfortunately, we can't do that because of the way the contracts are structured, though. The best we can do is offer you better rates and treatment if you come back and work for us on comics. If you work on this toy line, though, we can use this new design work on the characters in a different medium to grandfather you in. We can get you rights and royalties to all this stuff that you did that DC screwed you on. It very well could have been a line because Khan was basically tossing DC under the bus, admitting that they had piped Kirby and that they owed him better. She was just being honest, though, and this took Jack off guard. When he heard this, he apparently immediately became less tense, he settled down, and they were finally able to have an actual conversation. After Jeanette Kahn spoke so frankly and openly, explaining that while DC couldn't afford to pay Kirby what they felt he was owed, if he worked on the designs, they could assure him that Kenner would. As I've said before, Kenner was literally raking in cash hand over fist at the time with the Star Wars license and had fallen in love with Kirby's designs. They wanted to make his villains the central theme of the line and kept adding more and more of his characters as time went on until they comprised more than half of the lineup for the second wave of figures. Kirby knew this was the payday that he had been waiting for, and I'm not sure that he'd ever seen money like this all at once in his entire life. In fact, and this is kind of sad while also entirely unsurprising, Jack Kirby was actually paid more for simply redesigning his own characters for the Super Powers toy line than he was doing the entire Fourth World Odyssey to begin with. This is why Jack Kirby had just smiled and nodded during the back and forth at DC over the new material. There was no way Jack Kirby was giving up this kind of payday. He had suffered through so much worse for so much less before, and he felt like he owed it to both his family to make sure this deal went smoothly, but I think he also felt a doubt of gratitude towards Paul Levitz and especially Jeanette Kahn, who had been so open and honest with him, a true rarity in the field. This is the sense of loyalty, that undying fealty that I couldn't understand where it was coming from when I started researching this. Since Khan had become the president of the company the year prior, I think that Kirby saw Khan as DC and DC as Khan, making it important to him to make the deal work and ensure that they were pleased with what he produced. While I also never was able to find any concrete details concerning his payment, it had to have been pretty sizable considering the hoops that he jumped through concerning Hunger Dogs and the repeated rejection of the material that would eventually comprise Even Gods Must Die. Interestingly, it also seems like Kirby wasn't just content to simply redraw his original designs or hesitant to make major changes to them either. Just like everything else that he ever worked on, Jack Kirby seemed to impossibly take the work deadly serious. Kirby put some major time and effort into really rethinking and offering up some interesting possibilities for his creations that are truly interesting to look at. While most of these radical redesigns were rejected, it didn't stop Kirby from doing them, and man, are some of them cool. I think my favorite of these completely different redesigns is probably the Black Racer. Black Racer is basically death in the fourth world universe. 
In the comic, he's basically this dark, shadowy figure who rides on skis through the sky like some sort of reverse silver surfer or something. For his proposed redesign, though, Kirby came up with the concept that Black Racer could embody both life and death, that he would be light and dark at the same time. His proposal illustration so one side of the Black Racer's body with a lighter life-based motif, the other, the more traditional dark, black, brooding, death-like character who appears in the pages of the New Gods comic books. It's crazy to think how much time and effort, how much thought and consideration that Jack Kirby put into every single little thing like this that he did throughout his career, though I do feel like this one got a little bit of extra love and attention for a few reasons. Kirby was inordinately fond of his fourth world creations. I think it was clear that while they couldn't afford to compensate him, both Levitz and Khan, along with Giordano more than likely, all thought that Kirby deserved better pay and treatment, and this was their way of getting him that and Kirby responded in kind. There were bumps in the road, but I think everyone got what they wanted out of the deal, which was a rarity for Jack Kirby, or in fact, many people in the industry. Kenner got a smash hit toy line, which Levitz and Khan cleverly used to compensate other staffers, including George Perez, who was brought on to do design work as well. And finally, DC got not only a great toy line, but a final swan song from Kirby, something Marvel never would. Like I said, I don't have hard numbers on how much Kirby earned, but when I initially started looking into all of this, I was just mortified that something was going to go wrong, and I had wondered long time what precipitated Kirby's putting up with the back and forth over Hunger Dogs and material that would eventually become Even Gods Must Die. I think this clears that up pretty well and answers the question that so many people had been asking as why Jack Kirby would ever go back to DC after his treatment there in the past, as well as the troubles that were happening with the Superpowers comic line at the time. What? You didn't think we were done and we were just going to do this entire thing and not talk about the tie-in comic book series, did you? You must be new around here. Kirby, who was made to feel like DC was bending over backwards to help him out, did feel indebted to the company. He had a newfound sense of loyalty to them that I don't think he'd experienced in the past. When they asked him to do the four-issue miniseries that tied in with the toy line, Kirby couldn't help but say yes. The problem was he was not up to doing a monthly book or even a bi-monthly book at this point. Jack Kirby was almost 68 years old, and according to Greg Theakston, who was brought on to ink his work for the minis, Jack Kirby was doing four pages a day. That's an unholy task for a young man, and Jack Kirby was not in the shape he had been in even 10 years prior. He'd run his body through a virtual meat grinder, chained to his drawing table 10, sometimes 12 hours a day, six and seven days a week for more than 35 years straight. He was basically going blind in one eye. Sometime during this period, he suffered a major heart attack and had to undergo bypass surgery, though he would insist that even his closest friends not speak of his surgery and propagate a rumor that he'd been in a car accident instead. Kirby was mortified that Ruby Spears or Hanna-Barbera would fire him if they found out that he'd had a heart attack and that's why he couldn't work. Yeah, he definitely wasn't paranoid from working in comics at all, right? If that happened, he would lose his life insurance and Kirby was going to be damned if that happened. Kirby was also diagnosed with throat cancer and underwent chemotherapy, beat it, and went into remission, which I believe happened around this period. Also of note, Kirby slept poorly after the war, and looking back, I think it's pretty clear that the reason he was such a night owl and worked those crazy hours was because of PTSD. While he was often wont to exaggerate and make stories seem humorous or adventurous to take the edge off of them, Jack Kirby had seen and done some very very nasty things during his time in the service. He'd come back a changed man, and there's no understating what not being able to get a good night's sleep can do to a person over a 40-year period. You start getting irritable, you have weird mood shifts, and eventually you say, maybe start to almost 
drift off and you think you're flying a plane or a rocket ship instead of driving a car. Needless to say, he was not in any kind of shape to be doing four pages of a monthly comic book a day. Jack Kirby has always been fast with his pencils, and they had been getting looser and looser as the years passed, but Feekson said that when he got the pages from Kirby, there were major problems with almost every aspect of the work. While this would mark the last time Jack Kirby would draw DC's iconic characters like Superman and Batman, it ironically marked the first time that his art would be published unaltered when it came to many of those characters as well. Unfortunately, Kirby just wasn't up to the task anymore. According to Theakston, it was small things at first, like weird anatomy or rust pages, but it escalated into a full-on problem almost immediately. Kirby quickly stopped drawing in the logo on Superman's chest and other small details, he started messing up stuff. He couldn't get the lengths of Green Lantern's gloves right. He just couldn't see well enough to do stuff like that. So Kirby called up Greg Theakston. Kirby tried to play it off. You know what it looks like. You draw it in or fix the gloves. I'm working fast. Kirby tried not to make a big deal of it, but not long after, apparently he called up Greg Theakston again this time to ask if he would help with the interiors on the book. Theakston declined, saying he wasn't qualified for that kind of thing, and I think more meaning that he wasn't being paid for that kind of thing. The second Superpowers Mini would be the last monthly book that Jack Kirby ever took on, and for good reason. Kirby was absolutely miserable on the series, and for the first time, while his art was appearing unaltered in most cases for the series, he didn't draw like he used to. It might have needed a little bit of help and alteration. His health and PTSD combined with an unholy work schedule and drive make it easy to see why Jack Kirby was feeling burnt out on the series. Plus, the scripts were uninspired, to put it lightly. I mean, I don't think I'd be tossing my best work at a superpowered miniseries or anything, but Jack Kirby often complained about the quality of the scripts, and in 1986, almost three years into their little endeavor, when DC came to Kirby asking him to sign on for a third superpowered miniseries, as well as other books, he finally mustered the courage to politely decline the offer. There would be other books some stuff here and there after 1986, but Superpowers felt like the last real Jack Kirby book that DC put out for sure, and I'd always wonder why that was and how the hell they'd managed to get the juice out of Kirby on that book, and now I guess we all know. Well, that's it for this week, Boils and Ghouls. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. But before we go, I do have one question for you all. Since we've talked about basically every age of Kirby's work post-Marvel, would you all like to see an episode on Kirby's other 80s and 90s comic work, like Captain Victory, or even maybe an exploration of Kirby's romance books, of which he's considered to be the seminal architect? Get in the comment section below and let me know. Have you had enough Jack Kirby awards? you like to see some standalone specials about aspects and periods of his career that we've not touched on before in the future once I get some other stuff out. I've got some fun stuff, but I don't want to beat you folks over the head with it. So in the spirit of this being a DC series like the Jason Todd Hotline number, it is all up to you, boils and ghouls. Just let me know what you want and I will make it happen. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did enjoy what you saw, make sure you hit that like button. Think about getting in the comment section below and letting me know if you really enjoyed what you saw. Make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell so you never miss another video or premiere again. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page for as little as $3 a month month, you get access to tons of behind the scenes posts, updates, exclusive content like uncut interviews, and you can even get your name in the credits. If you want to support the channel, the Patreon is not your thing. Have no fear. You can finally sign up for membership right here on YouTube. Just hit the little join button and make sure to select the tier and the perks that fit you best. If that's not enough, you can also make one-time donations towards specific goals or just hit the channel using the Ko-Fi link in the description below. And you can even pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones 
you see on the screen now. As always, this video was brought to you by the Jerk Broadcasting Service, as well as generous grants from the Patreon, Ko-Fi, and YouTube members you see on the screen now. I seriously want to thank every single one of you that supports the channel and helps make these videos possible with a super special thanks to my loyal Wednesday Warriors, Channel 10, Chasen, Clinton, Salvini, and Mike Dolan. I really hope the quality and content is getting better, and I can't wait to see where this next year takes us with your continued support. Thank you again for helping this crazy dream of mine become a reality and for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something, and as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep it in those local shops, and keep reading comics.